So I just want to go over a couple of things with you real quick before we get started. First, um, I will have your papers graded probably by Wednesday. Um, if you are not satisfied with the grade you got on the paper, I also do give students a chance to revise for a better grade. So once I have the papers graded, I'll give you instructions and deadlines for that. Um, but uh, I also just wanted to kind of briefly say a quick thing, a couple of things about the exam. Um, I was going to spend a little time today going over the exam with y'all, but it doesn't seem like you need it. Um, because like, the grade range was from mid B to high A. So um, everybody actually did really well. Uh, so that said, I did want to ask you a couple of quick questions just about stuff we've been doing in the class and how it relates to the exam. Um, is there anything you think we could have done in class to better prepare you for the exam? Oh, well, thank you. So, what is the thing that has been most helpful for the, like things like the exam? The vocab. The Just, okay, going over the vocab. Yeah, like, I know that that's probably the least interesting thing that we do, but I can see that it's helping everybody remember things from session to session, from week to week. So, it, okay, so keep doing that. All right. I also think it's the quality of the notes you give us. Okay. Like you give us really good quality notes that I, mean, I felt prepared enough for being honest. Like I didn't really study for that essay. Like I just felt prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that like working on the vocab terms actually probably helps you with that as well because mm -hmm. you're getting the concepts and then you can work it into the essay. Okay. Well, that, that, okay. That, that, this is this is all good to know. Thank you. So. Um, Essentially, so for the second half of the semester, stay the course. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the presentations, and I can already see that I kind of fucked up the top of this. Um, yeah, I, I had actually written this uh, last Thursday, and then um, something happened, and uh, my computer blanked out. Um, so I had to redo this very quickly this morning, and I guess I didn't do a very good job at the top. <laughs> Anywho, these are not group presentations any longer. These are solo presentations because there aren't enough people to do group presentations in this class. Um, so each of you is going to give a 20-minute presentation on the topic you've been assigned. You're going to have to use at least five secondary sources. Um, and you can see in the assignments I've made some recommendations to each of you. These are all things that you can find either in our library or through the USG Consortium. So now that you have this list of sources, the best thing for you to do right after this class is go and order them from the library. If you don't know how to do that, um, you know, I have office hours after class and happy to show you how. Um, so <clears throat> you gotta use at least five secondary sources, or I've given each of you three, and you can then kind of branch out from there, right? I can give you some research tips as well if you, if you need and want them. Um, so, I was able to give just about all of you your first or second choice topic, because uh, again, we just aren't that many people in the class. Um, does anybody have any questions about this so far? Can we make like a PowerPoint? You can make a PowerPoint, but I've got some suggestions about that on the back here, right? So that was actually one of the next things I was going to get to. What you're essentially doing is like for the time you're talking, you're teaching the class. So um, think about the kinds of classes you actually like, right? And what those teachers do. Like, do you like sitting in a dark room while somebody reads off of a PowerPoint slide? Yeah, then don't do that to other people, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so try to mimic the practices of your favorite teachers. Um, and yeah, like you can bring in visual aids, like you can use like a PowerPoint or Prezi or Google Slides or whatever, right? But if you do that, the best way to do that is to just use it as a visual aid, right? Like if you've got pictures you want to show, um, or if you've got kind of like little bits of contextual text, right? Because, you know, I, I made the mistake early in my career of putting together, putting, you know, like a lot of text on PowerPoint lectures 
And I notice as I'm looking out of the classroom, everybody's just trying to furiously copy down what's on the slide, and nobody's really listening to a word I'm saying. So yeah, try to th you know, think about ways that you can keep your audience engaged, right? And if you need, um, if you need help, if you need hints, that sort of thing, right? Like I'm happy to talk through this stuff. In fact, I am going to want to see each of you a week before you do your presentation to see what you've got so far um, and what you might need a little help with, right? I'm, I'm, I want to try to set you all up for success, right? You know, I want everybody to look good. So it's 15 points total, right? Five points for command of the material, right? How well do you seem to understand what you're talking about? Five points for the quality of your visual aids, handouts, other supporting materials. And five points for the quality of your research. So does anybody have other questions? Yeah, so the, e each of these is going to have kind of an assigned text from, like you're going to be essentially teaching the text we're going to do that day. Okay. So I think you've got the World War I poetry, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you'll be teaching those World War I poems that we're looking at. Um, and Jordan, you'll be doing um, James Joyce's short story, The Dead, and trying to relate it to this particular topic. The other thing I do want to say, so if you have to give a 20 minute presentation, how much material should you have prepared? How long should you be ready to speak? If you have to be up here for talking for 20 minutes, how many minutes worth of material should you probably make sure you have? Probably about 30. Yeah, make sure you have at least a half hour of material, why? You might get nervous and skip something, right? You're probably going to, you might start talking really fast, right? And here's the thing, like, I'm not going to stop anybody or penalize anybody for going over time, right? So think of 20 minutes as a minimum. If you're doing a good job and you're on a roll, I'm just going to let you go. So prepare as much material as you want, right? And just make sure that it comes to at least 20 minutes. It's also best if you run through this a couple of times, right, before you actually have to get up and present. One, to make sure that you have enough, that you can meet the time limit. And two, just to try to build your confidence up. Right? The more we practice public speaking, the more confident we are when we actually have to deliver speech, the lecture, whatever, right? Okay, any other questions or concerns or problems? Since mine is over a text, should I just stick with, with just that text? You mean, um, the only, yeah, the only thing you're really going to be analyzing is the dead, right? Okay. But what you're going to want to try to, oh, okay. what you're going to want to try to do is like the same sorts of things that we do in class, right? So you might want to relate it to certain historical events or trends, right? Or, you know, in particular, like you're going to want to relate it in particular to like ideas of nationalism. And so some of the sources that I've given you will talk like not just about James Joyce, but also about, um, you know, like about like kind of what nationalism is and how it gets expressed. Like the, the Declan, the Benedict Anderson book is really just kind of about how nationalism emerges in the 19th century. And the Declan Kyber book is a kind of application of that to Ireland, if that makes sense. And you'll find a lot of similar stuff in uh, the stuff that I recommended for you, Savannah, right? And when you're doing research, you've got to find two more sources on your own, right? One of the best things for you to do is look for sources that your sources have used, right? If you notice, like, okay, like, there's this other book that everybody's referencing, I should, you know, you, you, you know that should kind of set a light bulb off, right? Okay, I should try to find that. Because that generally means that it's important.
Yeah, if you have trouble finding another two sources, um, come talk to me and I will help you. I may even be able to, like, some of these books I actually even have copies of in my office, so I may actually be, be able to loan some of you um, some of these things. Okay, anything else? Okay, so I'm just going to say, like, it always feels weird to me teaching a Christmas carol in the spring semester. It's like completely off in the calendar here, right? <laughs> Usually I end up teaching this like some like, like late October, early November. Um, but uh, so I'm assuming, given how kind of culturally ubiquitous, this particular Dickens novella is, like, that you have some awareness of this story already, right? So where does your awareness of this come from, if you have any? Elementary school. Okay, elementary school, okay. What in elementary school is that? I don't know, I just remember, like, during Christmas time, we do, like, the hot cocoa while we watch the Polar <laughs> Express, and I just remember, like, everyone talking about the Christmas Carol. Okay, okay. So talking about it while you're watching another movie. Yeah. <laughs> we do like a week of just watching movies, listening to Christmas Carol and all that. Okay, okay. And yeah, if I think like, like probably if you have encountered this text before, it's probably in a movie or a TV special, right? Mm -hmm. This has been adapted for film God knows how many times for stage, right? You know, so usually like, like, like the, when I ask students what they're familiar with, it's some kind of performance adaptation of this. Right? Like often it's, you know, nothing against the Muppets. Love the Muppets. <laughs> but yeah, we, can, we are not doing the Muppets Christmas Carol here, right? And if your familiarity with this ends there, right, then you're probably going to get confused along the way. So what was the, like, what was the experience of reading this like? like what, what did, what, were there particular things that you found interesting or surprising, given how familiar the general outlines of the story are? It almost seems like, obviously it followed the same thing like Path of the Future, you know what? Like, yeah, it's the same it, basic plot, yeah. It just almost seemed different than I guess what I remember. Okay. Like, that was like 10 years ago, <laughs> it's not longer. I don't know, it just yes, seems for, different. Yes, for you half a lifetime, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed more detailed. Okay. Like you could picture it better reading it. Okay. Picture yeah. Well, and, and it, it's, it's also you know, it doesn't have to move as fast if it's a book or it's a text. And indeed, like one of the things this gives us, right, is pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So we, you, know, you might remember we talked about gift books a couple of weeks ago when we discussed Mary Shelley. This was initially published in 1843 as a kind of slightly discounted gift book. All right, this was a, a sales gimmick that Dickens and his publisher had kind of cooked up. It's like, okay, like let's get this out for the Christmas season It'll be lavishly printed and illustrated like these gift books usually are, but we'll offer it at a lower price to try to sell more copies. So this book sold for five shillings in November 1843, uh, which would have been about $33. So not unreasonable as a price for like a middle class Christmas gift, right? Um, by point of comparison, um, most gift books sold for eight to ten shillings. So kind of like more like uh, kind of forty-five to sixty dollar range. Did it work? 
Did they sell more copies? They did sell a lot of copies, but it didn't end up being very profitable. But this was all kind of in keeping with um, a kind of broader philosophy that Dickens was pursuing in the early 1840s. Right? So the 1840s in Britain are referred to as the hungry 40s. So this decade was marked by a, kind of, by a long economic depression. that was caused by a number of factors. Right? One, you had several years of bad harvests. So the price of food went up significantly. You also had a big slump in international trade. And along with that, Mass unemployment. The population of Britain was also increasing at a fairly rapid pace. So you had more people to feed and fewer resources with which to feed them. Um, you also had, this was actually a big factor in the economic problems here. Um, it's actually, it's referenced a couple of times in the story, it's kind of a joke. Um, several American states had borrowed money from European banks and defaulted on the loans. So, <clears throat> Um, our bad debts over here contributed to depression over there. And so the way the British government tried to fight this was largely with what, are, what economists call austerity measures. Um, are either, do any of you know what this means, what austerity economics are? Okay, do you know what the word austerity means? Okay, so austerity uh, means kind of like living with minimal means, right? Cutting back, not, spe not spending on anything extra, right? So can we see what this might mean in like economic terms? If a government is implementing austerity measures, what does that mean they're doing with their budgets? Exactly, yeah, they're cutting, 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 right? So, yeah, the, the, the government tries to fight this depression with budget cutting. And it's not working. Right. Part of the problem here being, Dickens argues, that people aren't, the problem is that people simply aren't spending enough money. And if people were spending money, then that would get the economy moving again. And that the government could provide a better example by putting money into people's pockets to spend and by encouraging people to spend rather than to hoard, right? So if we look at how this works like in the character of Ebenezer Scrooge, what's, what are Scrooge's primary characteristics? What is Scrooge like? Okay, he's grumpy. Yeah, he's, he's, he is unpleasant, right? We see that in his interactions with several people, right? But what is what is this? What seems to be the source of his grumpiness? What does he care most about? Money. Yeah, money is his controlling master passion, right? And what does he do with his money?
spend it. Yeah, he just sits on it, right? You know, um, on page uh, 264, we're told that he is secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster, right? So let's think about that metaphor here, solitary as an, or that simile, solitary as an oyster. What does an oyster do? Just sit there, I guess. Okay, it just sits there, right? <laughs> and what's inside an oyster? A pearl, right? Yeah. But what does that oyster do with that pearl as long as it's alive? Yeah, just a, yeah. You, you can tell, like, if you say, like, if you work in a restaurant kitchen and you're serving oysters, right? You know that they've gone bad if they've opened up because then they're dead, right? As long as the oyster is alive, it's holding on to its treasure, right? Um, his interactions uh, with his nephew and then with those two gentlemen who come uh, calling for charity, um, we can see a little bit more of this, right? So if we look at the top of page 266 here, can I get somebody to start reading from I do, said Scrooge. I do, said Scrooge. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be married? What reason have you to be married? You're poor enough. Come then, returned the nephew gaily. What right do you have to be dismal? What right do you have to be worse? You're rich enough. Scrooge, having no better answer, ready on the spur of the moment, said, Bah, again, and fought about the comfort. Don't be cross, uncle, said the nephew. What else can I do, returned the uncle, when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you, but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. A time for balancing your books and having every item in them through a round, through a round dozen of months presented dead against you. If I could work my will, said Scrooge indignantly, every idiot who goes about with many Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a snake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle, pleaded the nephew. Nephew, returned Uncle sternly. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, repeated Scrooge's nephew. But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then, said Scrooge. Much good may it do you. Much good it has ever done you. Okay, so let's stop here, right? So what's the, what's at the center of this exchange here, right? What's Scrooge's problem with Christmas? Yeah, he's saying it's a waste of money, right? Spending money on frivolities, right? Rather than saving it for who knows what purpose he's saving it for, right? He doesn't seem to intend to give it to anyone. He lives in fairly bare bones apartments. Um, and we know that he doesn't pay his clerk very much either, right? We see on the next page. Um, page 267, right? There's another fellow, muttered Scrooge, who overheard him. My clerk, with 15 shillings a week and a wife and a family, talking about a Merry Christmas, I'll retire to Bedlam. So he's saying that like his clerk, you know, here's this guy whose pay is this low, and he's talking about a Merry Christmas. Well, what is Scrooge ignoring in this little bit of confusion here? Why is Bob Cratchit's pay so low? Who sets that rate? Scrooge. Yeah. He's the reason Cratchit is poor, right? Because <laughs> he doesn't pay him enough. And he's treating it as a problem not of him not being generous, right? He's treating it as a problem of Bob and the nephew, who's never, who isn't given a name here, 
Right? I think in most of the TV adaptations they call him Fred, but um, here he's not he's not named. But yeah, he's arguing that this is an example of other people being wasteful, right? Not of people like him being stingy. And indeed, when uh, you know when Bob uh, asks him for the day off, why is he pissed about it? If we look on page two sixty nine, starting with "You'll want all day tomorrow," I suppose. He's mad because he's so expected to pay him. Yeah, because you know it's a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every every December the twenty fifth, right? So he, he begrudges Bob any kind of paid holiday, even if it's a paid holiday that everyone gets, right? So I think we also see here an association between money and time, right? And this association between time and money. becomes really, really tight in Europe and North America in the mid-19th century. And I think we've talked a little bit about this before, right? Does anybody recall why our concept of time changes in the 19th century? What happens to make that change? There are two, actually two big things that happen to make it change. The first has to do with transportation. We start industrializing. Okay, yeah, industrializing is a big part of it, right? And workers are being paid an hourly wage, right? If you're a farm worker, you know, the hourly wage didn't matter. You got up with the sun, you went and you did your, you know, threshing and reaping and milking and whatever, right? And then when you were done with the work, you went home, made dinner, and went to bed. Right, so you counted your time in days rather than hours. But yeah, in the industrial economy, the worker is paid by the hour. And so, the business owner wants to extract as much value from each worker as he can, right? By paying as little as possible for as much labor as he can get. So time and money become kind of inextricable here. Right? The other thing, the thing I was getting out with transportation was the rise of railroads. That you had to be able to, you know, consistently predict when the train was actually going to show up. So that kind of standardizes uh, time across uh, most of Europe. Okay, so Scrooge associates time with money, we've got that, and he is tight-fisted, um, and begrudges anyone anything, right? If he has to give it. Now there are a couple of other things about him that I think it would be a good idea for us to try to understand before we uh, move further. So if we look, go back to page 267, and we look at his encounter uh, with these two gentlemen. Right. Can I get somebody to start reading from at this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge? Are you still in the country? 
they are still changing. I wish I could say they were not. The church is not in one lot or in one lot or in one lot or in Both very busy, sir. Um, I was afraid from what you said at first. That's something that I'm here to stop doing. The ladies of course, so to speak. I'm very glad to hear. Under the impression that there's scarcely Flemish Christians to your mom, to your own mom, or mom to the multitude. Return to the gentleman. A few of us are endeavoring to raise enough money to, pour, to buy the poor to meet and drink, a means of work. We choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is to be the and abundance of rejoices. What should I say you want? Okay, so let's pause here, right? So first off, let's think about these two gentlemen here and the set of social assumptions that they're operating under, right? What are they assuming like, about society, about one's duty to society? They're assuming that you should help people who are less fortunate than you. Yeah, you should help those who are less fortunate than yourselves, right? Like, that you should be willing to you know, like open your pockets to provide something more than bare subsistence to people who are uh, less well off, right? And how does Scrooge counter that? What does Scrooge seem to be assuming by asking, are there no prisons, are there no workhouses, is the poor law still in operation? Do y'all know what workhouses and the poor law were? Okay, so let's back up a little bit and explain that. Okay, so, Before 1834, in Britain, if you did not have the means to support yourself, you got what was called out relief. Which meant that, you know, maybe, you know, like you would get, you know, sort of like food and some money from the local authorities but you could stay with your family in your own home, right? They just brought it, you know, they brought whatever, you know, welfare funds were being paid for your support to you. In 1834, the poor law was reformed to try to centralize um, relief. So instead of letting people stay in their own homes and receive aid from the state, families were broken up and people were moved into like children, men and women were all put in separate facilities. Um, these were called workhouses. And in the workhouse people were usually doing like some kind of menial, usually relatively pointless labor. So, like one of the common tasks they would have you doing in the workhouse was called picking oakum. Right? Oakum is a substance that's used to coat ropes um, to make them waterproof. And like you were supposed, like picking oakum out of ropes was supposed to be used in the shipbuilding industry to help like coat the hulls of ships. But you couldn't pick enough oakum from ropes to actually make it useful. It was really just busy work. Right? It was based on the principle that it was better for people to be working at something pointless than for them to be not working at all. And in the workhouse, you were given a kind of bare subsistence diet, right? And you were kept there until you could demonstrate that you now had the means to support yourself. So if Scrooge is you know, asking, as these gentlemen are you know, asking him for money, he says, well, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Is the foreign law not in effect? Who is Scrooge arguing is responsible for taking care of the poor? Yeah, so then what do those have in common? Like where where, where where do those come from? Or like where are they who runs them? 
Yeah, exactly. So he's arguing that instead of individuals being responsible for taking care of the poor, right? It's the state's job, it's the state's business, right? This is what I pay taxes for. <clears throat> so the assumptions that the poor law makes are kind of similar to the ones that Scrooge makes. I want to point to a particular line, um, page 268, right there. you know, nothing Scrooge replied, you wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone, said Scrooge. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned, they cost enough and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, said Scrooge, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. So, <clears throat> what Scrooge is expressing here are two of the philosophical principles that this poor law reform, which Dickens opposed, are based on. Essentially, these reforms came from the, were influenced by the work of two philosophers, right? The first was a clergyman by the name of Thomas Malthus. And Malthus wrote a book in 1798 called An, An Essay on the Principle of Population. Malthus's basic argument was that population grows at a faster rate than food resources. Right? Essentially, the population grows through multiplication and food resources grow through addition. So it doesn't work quite as fast, right? You can't, like you reach a point where the population's growing so fast and you can't grow enough food to feed people anymore. Now, <clears throat> what would seem to be the logical solution to that problem? If population is growing too fast and we can't feed all the people, What would you think reasonably one would do, or a government would do? I mean, I don't know if it's right, but they could put, <laughs> oh, like that book I read on elementary school, you put like a limit on how many kids people can have. Okay, yeah. You, the, you, the, do you remember the Haddix book? Do you remember that? Oh. Sorry, it's not relevant. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay, but again, you're, you're thinking along the right lines here. So like, for example, when, when China had exactly this problem, um, they put that one child policy into effect, right? That, you know, every married couple could have only one child. Um, so limiting the growth of population, right? Now the problem that was created there was the cultural preference for sons. Um, you know, meant that um, you know a lot of um, you know a lot of little you know a, a lot of uh, female fetuses were either aborted or you know even if they, you know, they were delivered they were put into orphanages so the families could keep trying for a son right so this can you know this can create other problems yeah that's one way to try to limit population right you could also discourage early marriage, right? You could encourage people to try to marry later in life so they won't have as many kids. Um, you could encourage people to use birth control, right? Um, you could also try to encourage a more even distribution of resources throughout the population, right? So these are all things that Malthus considers and rejects. 
as basically immoral or as contributing to immorality. So for Malthus, the only moral way to deal with this problem is to let the poorest segment of the population, what Scrooge refers to here as the surplus population, die of starvation. And then that slows down the growth again. And you can get yourself back to you know, a point of uh, equilibrium. Now, the other thinker that, Scro that Scrooge and the authors of the Poor Law were citing is a guy by the name of Jeremy Bentham. And Bentham is associated with a school of philosophy called utilitarianism. And there are two basic principles that underlie utilitarianism, right? The first is that any idea must be judged in terms of its usefulness. But usefulness to a utilitarian has a very specific definition. An idea that is useful is one that either increases pleasure or reduces pain for a large number of people, right? So that's kind of gets at the other basic utilitarian assumption, right? Is that human beings are motivated by only two things. We seek pleasure and avoid pain. For a utilitarian, that's the only meaningful fact of human psychology, right? Is that we want pleasure and we don't want pain. So because receiving government relief is less painful than working, Bentham argued, or people extrapolated from Bentham's arguments, that people would rather receive relief than work. So what you had to do was disincentivize simply receiving relief, and thus the workhouse, where people are working, but they're not actually working in anything useful, is born. And Scrooge is kind of really kind of buying into all of this hook, line, like hook, line, and sinker here, right? He is all in at the beginning here on these philosophies. But one common criticism of both Malthus and Bentham is that their way of thinking is kind of deeply impersonal and treats most human beings um, almost like objects or counters, right? Rather than people with real thoughts or feelings. And I think there's some justification at the beginning here, we're thinking of Scrooge in this way as well. So if you look on page 264, can somebody read the paragraph for us near the bottom that starts with, uh, Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name? Because this tells us something actually really important about Scrooge. Scrooge never painted out old Marley's name. There it stood years afterwards above the warehouse door, Scrooge and Marley. The firm was known as Scrooge and Marley. Sometimes people new to the business called it called Scrooge Scrooge and sometimes Marley, but he answered to both names. It was all the same. So what is the important fact here that we learn about Scrooge and his sense of identity? What does he identify himself with? is it that he identifies himself with Marley. He's pretty cold about his only friend's death, right, in the preceding paragraph. He solemnizes the occasion with a bargain, or he gives him a cheap funeral, basically. Why does it matter 
that he answers to both Scrooge and Marley. What's the name of the business? Yeah, the name of the business is Scrooge and Marley, right? So, so what that he doesn't care whether people address him as Scrooge or as Marley? What does this tell us about where his identity is centered? Yeah, exactly. He identifies himself solely with the business. Right, not as a person, not as an individual, right? Merely as a representative of the you know, money lending business, Scrooge and Marley, right? Call me Scrooge, Carla, call me Marley. Right? Who cares? As long as you're giving me money, that's what matters. All right, one more thing that is important to note about this character, Ebenezer, Ebenezer Scrooge, at least as he appears to us at the beginning, right? So when Marley's ghost appears to him in, in his apartment, which also, like, again, to speak to that confused identification. Like, who did the apartment used to belong to? Who lived there before Scrooge did? Wasn't it Marley's? Yeah, he lives and he even lives in Marley's old apartment. So <clears throat> what does Scrooge wait? What does Scrooge believe Marley's ghost to be? What does he say Marley's ghost might be when it shows up? He mentioned something. Like he's like, this must be a case of food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. He's like, he, 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 he thinks like this is indigestion, right? Rather than a real visitation from a ghost, right? If you look on page 273, right? Marley's ghost asks him, this is actually a very important question here, right? Why do you doubt your senses? We'll come back to that in just a second. Because, said Scrooge, a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than a grave about you, whatever you are. So what does this suggest about the way Scrooge views the world, right? What is he, what is he thinking explains the appearance of this ghost? And how might we even relate this back to certain Gothic tropes from earlier in the semester? Do you remember what the difference was between horror and terror? Terror was it had an irrational explanation. Terror was like it's supposed to be real. Other way around, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just yeah exactly. Yeah, of course, of course, yes. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, the, the tale of terror always had some kind of rational material explanation, right? And that's exactly what Scrooge is trying to provide here, right? So Scrooge's whole view of the world is materialist in two senses, right? On the one hand, in the economic sense, right? That he is selfish and wants, thing, wants material goods for himself, right? But also, in the philosophical sense, he's someone who believes that the only thing that exists is matter, right? Right, only physical things actually exist. So if a ghost appears in his chambers, there must be some physical, biological cause, right? It's because dinner isn't sitting well with me, and I'm 
having a hallucination. But this notion of doubting your senses, right? Where before have we seen connections between your senses and your moral development? Think back a little bit. Does anybody remember it? You know, maybe the, the word, you know, benevolence. Or when we talked about sensibility. Wouldn't the monk be considered that? Um, um, yeah, there, there's, there's some, um, there's definitely some relationship between that and the monk, right? Does anybody remember what sensibility was? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Sensibility is your receptivity to sense impressions, right? And this helps form the basis of your moral development, according to some 18th century philosophers, right? Because if you are more receptive to sense impressions, you are better able to sympathize with other people, right? Because you're able to imagine what their situation would be like if you were in it. And this is a capacity that Scrooge seems to lack at the beginning of the novella. But then sort of to point on to sort of how he develops it, right? If we look at page 281, when he is, uh, you know, been taken by the ghost of Christmas past to visit his boyhood self, right? Then, with the rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said, in pity for his former self, poor boy, and cried again. So who's the first person he needs to learn to feel sympathy for? Himself. Yeah, until he can feel sympathy with himself, right? And develop, and really kind of restore a sense of his own identity. He can't really feel sympathy with other people. Now, <clears throat> what does Marley's ghost do to prove to Scrooge that it's real? What does he do that convinces him? that he actually exists. You'll find it on page 274. this, the spirit raised a frightful cry and shook its chain with such a dismal and appalling noise that Scrooge held on tight to his chair to save himself from falling in a swoon. But how much greater was his horror when the phantom taking off the bandage round its head, as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. So, if we're thinking about how Scrooge views the world at this point in the narrative, right? Why does this convince him the ghost is real? Think about it in particular in these, you know, this kind of second definition of materialist, right? What is the ghost proving to Scrooge here?
Is it like he shakes the chain and it makes the noise, and if the chains were real, then it would make the noise? I think that's part of it, right? That's the, the, the first part of the effect, right? But I think it's the second thing that the ghost does that seals the deal. his horror when the phantom taking off the bandage round its head as if it were too warm to wear indoors, its lower jaw dropped down upon its breast. So what was the function of the bandage around Marley's head? Keep his jaw in place. Yeah, it was keeping his jaw in place, right? <laughs> So, if removing the bandage causes the jaw to drop, right, it means that even if Marley looks insubstantial, right, then there's some real physical existence there. Even if it's not on the same plane of existence, that Scrooge is operating on. Now, um, The last thing that I really kind of want to focus on, and then we'll talk more about the encounters with the ghosts uh, next time. I want to spend a little bit of time on what Marley shows to Scrooge outside of the window. So can I get somebody to start reading on page 276 from... Scrooge followed to the window. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity, he looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and hither in restless haste and moaning as they would. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghosts. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were lead together. None were free. Then he had them personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost in a white waistcoat the monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant whom it saw below upon a doorstep. The mystery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. Whether these creatures faced into mist or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell. But they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. So have the, have the two of you ever heard the phrase, you can't take it with you? So what does that mean? If somebody tells you you can't take it with you, what are they encouraging you to do? Yeah, and especially, I mean, you know, if you've got money, spend it, right? Because it's not coming with you into the afterlife, right? Now what's happened to these ghosts? Not really allowed to go into the afterlife quite yet. Like they're stuck forever, wandering around, not really helping. Yeah, I think it's not so much a yet question, right? I think it's an ever kind of question here, right? Um, I think like they they exist kind of outside of time, right? But what are they weighted down by? And what's attached to their chains apart from themselves? We can even see the, the illustration here, right? Like what's what's this big fat ghost got weighing down his foot? Like a big box iron safe. Yeah, he's got a big iron safe weighing him down, right? Mm -hmm. So these misers, right, did take it with them. But in the afterlife it does no one any good, right? So all of that hoarding 
ends up being ultimately pointless. And all it does to the hoarder is <clears throat> you know, punish them for the good they could have done and didn't. And I think we're about uh, we're about time, so I think we'll wrap it up there. I'll give you the reading questions for next time, and we'll discuss the familiar encounters with the ghosts. And one thing I want you to pay particular attention to is the the physical descriptions of the ghosts, kind of like the possible symbolism of those physical descriptions.